In the previous video, we looked at trigonometric integrals, and we saw that we could use all the power of the different types of trigonometric identities to convert kind of messy and, and horrible integrands into much simpler integrands that could just be dealt with with a single u substitution. So using trigonometry is very powerful because of all these trig identities, but I want to be able to extend that to cases where it isn't transparently an integral that has anything to do with trigonometry. Maybe there isn't a trig function in sight. And what we're going to do is we're going to be able to introduce trigonometry by saying that the, the x variable is equal to some trigonometric expression. And this converts by a sort of substitution, or if you prefer, a reverse substitution. It converts your integral that isn't about trig into one that is about trig, then you can use trigonometric identities to help you out, and finally you can get the answer. So it's kind of a little bit backwards from how we normally do substitution. Normally what we look at is we say, uh, I've got a big portion of this integral that's messy. For example, maybe I have all of the stuff underneath the square root sign, and I'm going to say u is all of that messy part. That normally a u substitution takes the mess and it sort of cleans it up a little bit. Here what we're doing is we're not taking a messy part, we're just taking everywhere the variable x and dx occurs, and we're converting them into a trigonometric thing, which almost seems like it would be messier, but the hope is that the trig identities are going to make our lives a little bit easier. So let's see how this works in a specific example. So here, uh, note that we can't immediately do the obvious u substitution because I, I have this x cubed on the top. If I, if I got rid of the x cubed, I could just set u equal to the stuff underneath the radical. But I have this x cubed. And it might be the case that we can do an integration by parts here. I think it works out as well. But I'm going to show how we can use a bit of a different trick of u substitution. So what I'm going to do, and, and, and watch the magic of this, is I'm just going to say x is equal to 3 tangent of theta. Now, I know that this is one that's going to work, but the, the way that I anticipated it being this one and not sine theta or cos theta or anything else, is that if we just think about what happened if I go to the denominator and I put in the 3 tangent of theta, well, I'd have a 9 squared of tangent squared theta plus 9. Maybe we'll pull out the 9. So tangent squared plus 1. And I have a trig identity for tangent squared plus 1. I could take tangent squared plus 1 and convert it into secant squared. This is not the case if I'd used x equal to 3 sine theta, for instance. Then I'd be able to have a 1, or excuse me, a sine squared plus 1, but I don't have a trig identity for sine squared plus 1 the way I do for tan squared plus 1. So I claim this is a reasonable substitution to work, and let's just believe me for a moment, we'll see how it works out. I suppose I need to denote or note that dx is 3 secant squared of theta d theta. There's one other a little bit of an alarm bell that goes off in my head when I see this, which is that I have these limits of integration, the x equal to 0 and the x equal to 3. Now, when I convert them, I know that tangent of theta has actually infinitely many theta values that are going to make 3 tan theta equal to 0. I, I want to do my conversion, but I only want to have one answer. So I need to, to do something to restrict my domain, to make this well-defined, to make it so that for every x value, there's only a single theta value. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to restrict the domain. And the restriction I'm going to use, I'll just do sort of a, a back of the napkin graph of what tangent of x looks like. It's one of these things, right? Got all of these uh, vertical asymptotes, it's periodic. And I'll note that if I was to choose just sort of one of these branches, well, it hits everything. It goes from minus infinity up to positive infinity. Every possible x value is satisfied inside of here, but it's only satisfied once. So that's how I'm going to restrict the domain. I'm going to say it's from minus pi over 2 to theta up to theta, or excuse me, up to pi over 2. So I've got this restriction of the domain, and the whole point of restricting this domain here is so that this substitution is well defined. In other words, for every x value, there's only one theta value. All right, with that little sort of pedantic point established, let's proceed. We've made some substitution. And our goal is to 
plug that substitution into this thing and see what we have. Dx says, note that there's there's really an implicit x equal to zero and x equal to three in front of these limits. So let's convert the limits first. If I have x equal to zero, well, we just said that x is equal to three tangent of theta, and tangent of theta is often zero, but in this restricted domain, that implies that my theta has to be equal to zero. See the point of the restricted domain? There's only one answer here. Further, if my x is equal to three, and we're setting that equal to three tangent of theta, well, three equals three tangent theta is the same thing as one is tangent of theta, and indeed, there are many thetas where tangent of theta is one, but there's only one such theta inside of this domain. It's theta equals pi divided out by four. Okay, so I've got these two different substitutions, so I think I can figure out exactly what it's gonna be. Well, my limits are established, zero and pi over four. The x cubed on the top, three cubed is 27, so 27 tangent cubed of theta. On the bottom, I have the square root of three squared is nine, so nine tangent squared theta plus nine, and I have to convert in for my dx. Don't forget your dx. It's another three secant squared of theta d theta. Okay, now I want to use the trig identities that I've indicated are going to be important here. On the denominator, I have this nine. I can pull that out easily enough. So maybe I actually I should even just do that. Maybe I'll clean it up. Let's write it as zero to pi over four. The nine comes out, but when it leaves the square root, it becomes a three. The three cancels with the three I have in the numerator, and that leaves me with 27, 10 cubed theta secant squared. There's the three I've gotten rid of. D theta all over the square root of 10 squared theta plus one. So there it is, a little bit cleaner. And now I'm gonna use my trig identity. I know that for the 10 squared theta plus one part, that is just gonna be secant squared. So square root 10 squared theta plus one is square root of secant squared theta. We're gonna be a little bit careful here. Square root of something squared, that's the same thing as the absolute value of theta, but notice how the restriction of the domain is gonna come in. Secant is one over cosine, but between minus pi over two and pi over two, cosine is always positive. So the absolute value doesn't do anything. This is just the same thing as secant of theta, but only because we are in our domain of minus pi over two up to theta, up to pi divided out by two. So this restriction of the domain wasn't just sort of a theoretical point we put at the beginning, it turned out to be critical actually in the middle of our computation, so I didn't have to break this into multiple cases and do a lot of mess. Okay, so knowing that, can we clean it up a little bit further? Zero to pi divided by four, my 27 is still along for the ride, tangent cubed of theta, Secant squared, there's a copy of secant that goes away, so now it's just secant theta d theta. Okay, and I have some answer that looks like this. So, to summarize, we've made this trig substitution to an integral that initially didn't have any trig. We were careful with the restriction of the domain, and now we've converted it faithfully. This is just a trigonometric integral. This is an integral that we could have done last class. So I've, I've taken that final integral, I've written out the solutions for you. If you prefer, you can pause the video here, try to write it out as a practice of the content from, from the previous section. But nonetheless, we have our final answer, some big messy expression, because at this point, after we've converted into a trigonometric integral, it's just using the methodologies that we already know. Now, in this table, I've summarized what type of trig identity you should use for what type of expression. And in particular, these turn out to be relatively useful whenever you have one of these square root of a plus or minus x, or maybe in a different order, something like that. These different types of radical expressions are the types of integrals where this methodology is useful. And you have two approaches. If you wish, you can just blindly memorize this particular screen. I don't really recommend that.
the way I do it, and in fact, I, I don't actually usually have it memorized unless I've been doing a whole bunch of these problems all in a row, is I, I know that it, this method of trigonometric substitution works broadly when things kind of look like these types of square roots. And then what I'm trying to decide, is it a set, or is it a sine, is it going to be tangent, what is the substitution to make? Well, in that case, I think... I play around with each of them in my head and I sort of say, okay, if I put the sine theta into the first one, then it's going to be a, a 1 minus sine squared. I do have a trig identity for that. I have 1 minus sine squared is cos squared. But if I had put in tangent of theta, then I'd have 1 minus tan squared and I don't have a trig identity for it. So that's how I make this adjudication between which of these substitutions I'm going to use is, is I, I sort of substitute them in in my head or do a little bit of chicken scratch and see whether I'm going to have a useful trig substitution come out, or trig identity that I can use. And then secondly, I have to be careful attention to the restriction of the domain, and the restriction of the domain that I'm doing is I'm just choosing the largest region I can, where for every x value there's a single, there's only one theta value associated to it. And indeed, in the previous example where we used tan theta, minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 was like an entire sort of branch, if you will, of tangent. It went all the way in the y values from minus infinity to plus infinity is as many values as I could possibly have, but they all only occurred once. So it was sort of like the largest region that worked and was sufficient. So that's why I used the minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 region. So you can do sort of a similar analysis for each of these different steps. Finally, just a few points to Finally, just a few quick reminders. Uh, first of all, be always careful to be writing your dx's, and this applies quite generally. Make sure you have the dx and you're not getting sloppy and thinking, hey, it's always there, I'm not going to bother writing it, because converting the dx is very important. And in this case, these problems are often only doable because you have this dx that is also converted into a bunch of trigonometric expressions. Secondly, we saw a definite integral in this video where we had different values. 0 to 3 was our original uh, example. If it's an indefinite integral where you don't have values, you, the agreement that we have is, is that your final answer should always be written in the original variable, not in some intermediate substitution variables. So our agreement always is going to be write your final answer in terms of the original variable. And finally, as we've seen, it's important both for theoretically to believe that we have a sound uh, mathematical demonstration, but more importantly, practically, to do this restriction of the domain. As we saw, we have issues like absolute value of secant theta. We want to just call it secant of theta, but that's only valid if we restrict our domains. So there are problems that can confuse you, and you have to be careful with your minus signs. So make sure that you're carefully restricting your domain every time you do one of these problems.